inventing new medications designed to help only one person, you. Using substances the body makes to build itself and repair itself. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. We've been looking into what effect genetic research has had on the pharmaceutical industry. First off, it spawned a tongue twister named pharmacogenomics. That's pharmacogenomics. And that's the study of how an individual's genetic inheritance affects the body's response to drugs. Creating individualized drugs is the ultimate goal. In private laboratories like the company Human Genome Sciences, researchers want to develop drugs based on the body's natural defenses to disease and injury. We're doing the first stage, using substances the body makes to build itself and repair itself as medicine. William Hazeltine's company, Human Genome Sciences, recently received FDA approval for the next phase of clinical trials of a protein spray called Repifermin. Repifermin is used to treat large festering sores and promote healing of the skin. It's a product of a human gene called keratinocyte, growth factor 2, and was developed after screening 10,000 different genes. As with all drug research, developing gene-based drugs can lead to a gold mine or a dry hole. It's my conviction that the shortest way to create a new and better medicine that can cure and treat disease is to focus on human genes. Finding treatments and cures isn't a simple task. When we talk about drugs, we're talking about prevention before disease strikes and treatment after disease or injury. With drugs based on genetics, we can think of it as repair and restoration. That's the beauty of the genome, is that it's DNA. It's the common currency for, for anything. So every organism has DNA, so if you have a DNA-based technology, it can be applied to any pathogen. Vaccines are the basis of disease prevention, and Stephen Johnston is working on gene vaccines. But what are gene vaccines? I think we need a little help here, computer. Okay, Lucky, this is pretty simple, in theory. Let's say you have a pathogen. A nasty bacterium would have 4,000 to 5,000 genes. You break them down into groups of 40 and inject them into your test animals, usually mice. If any of your mice don't get sick, They've gotten genetic material that protects against that pathogen. So you take the 40 genes tested in each of those mice and introduce them individually to some new mice. When you locate the genes that protect against the disease, you've got your potential vaccine. It's even easier with viruses, since they have fewer genes. Easy in theory, but very complex in the biological world out there. And that is why we haven't seen any gene vaccines in our doctor's offices. There are still safety issues to be addressed. But there's also the question of whether gene vaccines will work in humans. Even though they protect mice, in primates, these experimental vaccines haven't as yet been able to evoke high levels of antibodies, the proteins our bodies make to fight a specific infection. One effect of the simian barrier is that in monkeys and humans, the vaccine will need a thousand times more DNA to get a response, and that response will only occur at the cellular level. It usually does not spur the animal's antibody system to respond. Johnston and others are working to overcome that problem with something called a prime boost, two hits with different forms of the vaccine. The first form will be the new gene vaccine and then the boost, which is created by taking a gene, often the same one, and increasing its effectiveness by inserting it into a harmless virus. The viral boost uh, really expands its, its strength. And so if uh, you're getting very potent immune responses this way. The major drug firms are also turning to genetics to develop treatments. Pfizer is one of the largest and one of the organizations that funds Secrets of the Sequence. Ralph Stevenson is Pfizer's Director of Diabetes and Obesity Research. As we pointed out earlier, diabetes is on the rise. 
Stevenson is keenly interested in a mutation in the aldose reductase gene that affects glucose metabolism in diabetics' eyes, kidneys, and nerve cells, which in theory makes some diabetics more likely to suffer serious complications such as blindness or kidney failure. The genetic information that we have now suggests that we can identify the population that are more likely to get diabetic complications, and so we know which patients to try and treat to try and get the best responses. The degree of overweightness in this country is so great that we reckon that almost half of the US population is overweight to some degree. So you can just imagine how much diabetes that's likely to incur over the next decade or two decades. In fact, the World Health Organization estimates that by 2025, there will be about 300 million diabetics worldwide complications resulting from diabetes would amount to a huge public cost for treatment and care. Surely a fertile field for pharmacogenomics. We don't know yet what type of treatment this research on obesity and diabetes might lead to. It's likely to be a treatment that changes how cells function without changing the individual's genetic background. Treatment that does try to alter someone's genome is called gene therapy, replacing a defective gene with a normal one. The early excitement about gene therapy has been replaced with caution based on its limited success so far. The death of Jesse Gelsinger in 1999 was a huge setback. The 18-year-old was participating in a gene therapy experiment when he died. Eventually, it was determined that the cause was not the gene, but the virus used to deliver it. Gelsinger's death brought the brave new world of gene therapy in the U.S. to a temporary halt. Now for what may be the good news. In the past few years, physicians have used gene therapy on several young children with severe combined immunodeficiency disorder, or SCIDS. It's caused by a defective ADA gene, which is crucial for immune cells to function properly. The infants were always at risk of death from minor infections. Their gene therapy involved removing some of their immune cells, adding new genes riding on viruses to the cells, and infusing the repaired cells back into their bone marrow. After years of frequent sickness, they're now said to be normal, healthy youngsters. Genetic research is still a very young science, still in the crawling stage. The researchers dream of its ideal, the ability to create unique, individualized treatments as needed that act specifically and safely. And a lot of hopes and fortunes are riding on that dream. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.